Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming along tonight or staying at home, whatever way it works. Really. Um, so for tonight's talk, I thought I'd like to start with a fact. And the fact is that it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become expert at anything. And this was an idea that was uh, made famous by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Outliers, in which he talks about people like the Beatles and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and how they, they actually spent this 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to actually get good at their craft and how to become an expert. And I started thinking about this and I thought, well, what does 10,000 hours actually mean? Well, if you do the calculation, it comes out at about five years full-time work, which when you think about it, it doesn't seem too bad, really. Um, certainly apprenticeships used to last five years, something like that. Um, and I know that in my job that I was, wasn't that good at it uh, for the first four or five years until I really got to grips with it. So I thought there's some, something about this, but what's this got to do with photography? Well, I started to think, how can I become an expert photographer? And uh, after some thought, I, I worked out how many hours I could actually spend deliberately practicing photography. And when you allow for family commitments and work and chores and whatever else, I reckon that I could allow about 10 hours a week, which means that I'd be expert in only 20 years. Um, so I thought, thought that's okay, but maybe I could get to be an expert quicker. And I started to work out when, what hours I had and how I could spend more time taking photos. I couldn't really work anything out until one day I thought to myself, I've got five hours a week that are mine that I'm not using. And those are my lunch hours. And if I use those five hours, then I'd be expert in 13 years. Still a long time, but, you know, not too bad at all. So this is where the London Life, London Life project came from, because I work in, um, in the middle of London, and I thought I could get out in my lunch hours and actually take photographs in my lunch hours and, and help myself become expert at photography. Now, a lot of people would be jealous being able to take pictures in London. Um, there's, you know, people tell me there's loads of things to take pictures of. But to be honest, I'm much happier um, by the side of a tarn in the Lake District as the sun sets or um, down at South End uh, first thing in the morning as the, as the tide comes in. Um, <clears throat> that's my sort of natural habitat, not really in the middle of a, a built-up city, uh, in the middle of the day, the worst lighting, you know, I, I mean, for years I came out of my office and I would see people taking pictures and I'd think to myself, what are you taking pictures of? It's only the Bank of England or it's, it's only Tower Bridge. You know, these aren't particularly interesting things. So that was kind of um, where I was coming from. But kind of the point of the project is that to not just do the things that you're good at, but to do the things you find difficult as well. Because if you do the difficult stuff, it'll make the easy stuff even easier and more instinctive. Um, so that was the project. Um, where did I start? Well, I started with architecture because there's always buildings being knocked down in the city, rebuilt, um, recreated. Um, there's always work going on. Um, and this building here, this blue building here. Um, sorry, my, my door has developed a terrible creak. Um, this blue building here is um, uh, the, I think it was Northern Insurance now, but it, I think it was HSBC at one point. And this has become a, a, a regular haunt of mine, and I'm often taking pictures of this. And you'll see a few pictures of it tonight. Other things. Um, well, this is the City Point building, um, and as I wandered around it, it's modern architecture, it's got lots of uh, new shapes in it, I just wondered if I could just cr create it 
make it look like a roller coaster, which is what I aim for. So next to um, St Paul's Cathedral, they've created a shopping arcade and um, uh, offices on top, uh, a building called One New Change. And the architect had such confidence in their building that they thought what they would do was they would cut a big slot through the middle of it so that you could look at something a bit prettier, like St Paul's. And um, so this is the shot everybody takes from One New Change, uh, the reflections of St Paul's and the gap in the middle. But what a lot of people don't realise is that what you can do is you can go to the lifts and get the lifts up to the top floor, up to the roof, and take some shots from up there. And I was up there when it was very first opened. Um, and this was, um, they hadn't fitted out the restaurants then. Um, and this was the inside of one of the restaurants. And I just like the contrast and the shadows and the, and, the, and the way it all put together. So, quick uh, quiz for you. You have to look at my little picture up in the corner if you've got it. Anybody recognize what one of those is? No. Anybody? No? Clearly you're... Blue Finder. <laughs> what was that one? Angle View Finder. Correct, an angle finder. So for those of you who are too, too young to know what these things are, the angle viewfinder or angle finder um, goes on the back of your camera like that. Uh, and the idea is you can look down there, the periscope basically, uh, you can look down there and for things like shooting fungi and stuff like that, um, it saves your needs basically. It's been almost completely superseded by the idea of the flip out screen. But um, one day I was looking at this and I thought to myself, what happens if instead of looking down at it, I use it like this? Suddenly I've got a camera that only points upwards. And I spent a week taking pictures like that. And uh, so this is uh, Tower 42, what was the NatWest Tower, taken using um, an angle finder. Now, these days you can do it with a, a flip out screen or you could always lean back. I found leaning back makes your head really, really spin. But uh, a flip out screen will really help. Um, and here's the uh, Lloyds building. Uh, using the same technique. So this building here, um, the people who built it would like it to be called uh, 20 Fenchurch Street, the Sky Garden, the Walkie Talkie Building. The only problem with that is that um, the architect, in their infinite wisdom, decided that what they were going to do is they were going to create the walls out of a sheet of curved glass. And they curved the sheet that way and that way. So you've got them. And if you can't curve a sheet of glass like that, what you actually create is a giant concave mirror that focuses the rays of the sun into the street below and was generating so much heat that it was melting cars in the street. And this was towards the end of the summer. Um, and it also, um, <laughs> If you walk past there to this day, there's a hairdresser's opposite, and they've got a big burn mark in the carpet, all caused by this building. Um, and so at great expense, they had to put slats down the front of the building to stop it melting and things. But that is why, um, amongst locals, it's often called the fry scraper. Um, and here's my take on the fry scraper. Uh, there's one angle. And... Here's one of it looking uh, particularly aggressive. I like that set of eyes up the top. They're like something from a Disney film of an uh, evil um, thing. Uh, similarly, you can get up the top of, if you want a different view of it, you can get up to the top of the, um, so you, sorry, uh, yeah, I knew there was something I was gonna say. Um, the fry scraper itself, or the Sky Garden, if you go to skygarden.london, which is a, a website, um, and what they can do is they'll give you they, you can get free tickets to take uh, to go up to the top, um, 
And from there, for my money, the view is better than the top of the shard. Now, you will need to pre-book your tickets, and you do need to go through airport-style security, and you need to have ID. But you can get up the top, and you can wander around and take pictures. Um, similarly, um, this is round behind the, the gherkin. It's called the Garden at 120. And you don't need to pre-book this, but you, can, you need to go through security to get on the top. But if you wander around the top, um, uh, you can get shots like this. You can also get shots of the Old Bailey um, and um, ta the Tower of London on the other side. Could you hold for a second? I can hear things happening. It's actually quite interesting, Chris, saying all of that, because the, his fry scaper is actually where I work. Oh, is so it? I'm going to London. Yeah, I'm on the 15th floor there. Yeah. So it's just a, halfway up. So I don't actually have to do all of that airport security because we've got an internal lift and we can go up to the roof whenever we want. So it's a remarkable building because no matter what angle you are down on the ground, if you look around, the building looks different on each of the four sides. I mean, it looks pretty much the same if you see these sort of things, like the images that we've got here. But as Chris's, in, Chris's photo showed, no matter where you are, you look up just fabulous different angles. Sorry. <laughs> Having to deal with that. Yeah. Dog. Um, right. Yes. Yeah, so I was just telling everyone, I was just actually telling everyone. Um, your fryscaper is actually my office. So, oh, is it? <laughs> what floor are you so, on? And where you were saying about the uh, one new change, yeah. um, I've actually taken some of the, the club members there before because I do the I, one of the buildings I do the insurance for, so I get to see all oh. of these sort of places myself. Cool, man to know. Being to see these places that you come up with tonight. <laughs> You tell me where I'm going wrong. That's what, that'll be it. Yeah. Um, so oh, yeah, so this tell. is a that's the view from the garden at one twenty. Um, up at Holborn, the old um, Prudential building, you can wander around inside the square inside that now. And I was walking around there one day, and I saw this scene, and the winter sunlight was bouncing off the floor. <laughs> lighting up the underside of this vaulted ceiling. And I took it and I thought, that's a nice pattern shot. But it wasn't until I got it home that I suddenly saw two eyes, a nose and a mouth. And suddenly it looks really, really angry at me all the time. Um, funny how once you've seen that, you can't not see it. Really. So taking pictures every day is harder than you'd think. Um, because um, odds on, if you remember to bring your camera with you, um, you've probably left the card in the card reader, or if you remember the card, you've probably left the battery in the charger. And if you remembered all of them, you're probably going out that evening, uh, so you don't want to take an expensive camera out with you anyway. So, but you don't have to always use a proper camera. Sometimes you can just use your phone because you're still exercising your compositional muscles. You're still doing what we do as photographers, which is to impose structure in a chaotic world. Um, and so you're still using that parts of your brain that decide what you're going to take photos of. Just because you did it on a phone doesn't make it any less valid. Um, so this isn't the Namura building down by uh, up a Thames Street. And what you're looking at here is the, the sun glinting off the Thames and then reflected on the underside of these um, gantries on the side or balconies, I suppose. When I was taking this, um, suddenly I've got my camera, I'm taking a few pictures, and suddenly this uh, security guard comes up to me and he says, can't take pictures of the building, mate. But without responding, the first thing I did was to look down. Because what you're looking for is around the outside of a building, you'll often find um, either a brass strip or a line of brass studs. And they will mark the actual sort of um, boundary of the building itself. 
in the same day that most people don't build their house right up to the edge of their property line, they will leave a little bit of garden. Quite often you'll find a, a brass strip marking the actual land they own. Um, and in this case, I looked down and immediately saw that I was on the public side of this brass strip. So the security guard can do nothing. Yeah, I'm on public land. I can take as many pictures as I want. So the conversation went like this. Can't take pictures of the building, mate. You sure? Seem to be managing it. Now you can't take pictures of the building. Yeah, I can. Look, I'm doing it. Well, I won't tell you what he called me, but it wasn't very complimentary at all. Um, so it's traditional most of the time um, in London photography blogs and uh, talks to talk about problems with security guards um, and occasionally the police. I've never had any problems with the police. Um, security guards, uh, especially this area here, this is more London, which is the area around, um, around City Hall and around near Tower Bridge. And the security guards there um, can be a bit zealous, overzealous, um, and uh, they're definitely very tripodophobic. And if, you, um, if you're there and you're taking photos, um, quite often they will give you some hassle. Uh, I'm usually okay because, um, so if you want to um, get problems with security guards, you want to take a leaf out of my friend Steve's book. Because my friend Steve will go out and first of all, he'll take himself a nice big camera, a nice big full frame camera, and it'll probably stick a blooming great lens on the front like that. So now we've got our camera. And then what we do is we wander around and we go. For ages. And the security guard will see him do that and give him a load of hassle. I don't do any of that. So I will shoot all my stuff. I use a, uh, this is an Olympus pen. Uh, or an EM10 is my current camera. Um, tiny little micro four thirds camera, um, still functionally equivalent to that big beast behind, interchangeable lenses, everything you need in a camera. But this will just fall into my um, pocket. Um, it's always there. And I'll just have it set up, aperture priority, F8 probably. And then all I'll do is before I take the shot, I'll pre visualize. Um, I know exactly what it is and what I'm framing. I've worked the framing out before I pick the camera up. So I just pull the camera out of my pocket, focus, click, put my camera away. So by that time, if the security guard sees you, um, he's, but you've walked off and then they've lost interest. Um, so I've never told my mate Steve this. Um, I always tell him that he gets so much hassle from security guards because he looks like a villain. Um, but especially around more London, it's a shame because you get these, um, it's got some great architecture in more London. It's got this Batman building and this triangle place here. On, um, and it's, it's one of the really most photographed places in London. Um, but, you know, you try and want to try and avoid having hassle with the security guards. And if you um, want to use a tripod, then uh, contact them first and try and get permission, to be honest. Two and a pointy buildings. This is the Shard. This is the tallest building in Western Europe. And these poor sods have got the job of cleaning the windows. Um, rather them than me, to be honest. Um, looks a bit scary, but there you go. And, uh, you know, even if you've got a pretty ordinary uh, tower block, if you just turn the camera a bit, you can get a different angle on it and make it look like a glass pyramid. Just try a different approach to something that's quite traditional. You don't have to shoot everything in the same way. Um, Broadgate. Um, so the Broadgate is near Liverpool Street Station and um, it's currently being refurbished and each of the buildings has been torn down and replaced by a new one. This is five built uh, Broadgate, which is uh, one of the new ones. Um, and it's an amazing piece of architecture. It's got some great shapes on it. You can spend ages trying to find a, a good angle on it that, that works for you. Um, and next door to number five, they've now got number three, which is clad in these um, these tiles. Um, it looks really 
really pretty cool as far as I'm concerned. And you can spend ages playing with those tiles to get different angles on. Um, the other thing about Broadgate is that the Broadgate company own the airspace above the tracks um, at Liverpool Street Station. And we think, what use is it to own the airspace? Well, over the years, what they've done is they've built um, on bridges, they've built buildings over the top of the railway line. You can see one's on a great big arch. And another one that they've sort of wedged in between the railway lines and, and sort of cantilevered over it is the uh, Broadgate Tower. Um, amazing piece of architecture, sort of odd shape, because clearly that was the shape they could get it in on the land itself. Um, Southwark Cathedral, this is a, a fairly regular haunt of mine. Um, costs £2.50 to get in um, with a camera, otherwise it's free. Um, but for that £2.50, you get a little guide leaflet um, and you don't get hassled for using a camera, which is much better than, um, say, St Paul's, because you can't even use a camera inside St Paul's. Um, and it charge, they charge you a lot more than that just to get in. Um, so this is a great place to pop out of it's maybe on a rainy lunchtime and just play with different ideas. You know, play with um, shade and shadow and light um, or, the, or try and do some pattern shots with a big vaulted ceiling it's got. Um, or just some standard sort of church shots of candles and things like that. Talking of candles, they have a, um, every now and then they have a candlelit photography evening. And what they do there, and it's, it's, I think it's quite cheap. I think it was about 10 quid or more than eight quid, something like that. Um, and you turn up and you turn up and it's um, light. And then as the sun goes down, the, the church gets darker and darker and darker. And they light the candles to give you something to take pictures of, um, which is quite fun, gives you a lot of um, different things to take shots of. The only thing I would say is what you soon realise is just how dim candlelight actually is, because um, by the time the sun's gone down completely, all you can hear around the church is the sound of photographers tripping over and swearing or tripping downstairs and, or bumping into things, because as soon as you move away from the candles, there's just no light at all. It's really, really dim. Um, so uh, this is one from their candlelit photography evenings. Um, and uh, for the judges amongst you, yeah, there's somebody's camera backpack there, um, just to prove that I wasn't on my own. Around the outside of the cathedral, you get Borough Market. Um, Borough Market is a food market, famous food market. And um, <coughs> this has the advantage that nobody minds you taking photos. In the closed market, um, people don't like you taking photos because what people do is take photos, steal a design, and then knock it off in the thousands in the Far East. Um, so, I mean, it really doesn't matter. If you take a picture of somebody's gingerbread men, it really doesn't bother them at all whether it's not going not to affect their business at all, so they don't mind. So you can try things like maybe um, doing some still life stuff with some of the displays. Um, or get your macro lens out and get up close and personal with some French bread. You know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, really. Now, um, another favourite location of mine is, for want of a better term, the City of London rubbish dump. And this is down by Cannon Street Station. And what, what happens is that the... Um, all the rubbish carts from around, around the city of London come back uh, to there. Uh, they're unloaded and, and the rubbish is packed into containers. And the containers are then lifted up over the Thames path and put onto barges. And then when the tide comes in, the barges are floated down the um, river and dumped somewhere, somewhere nobody cares about, like Kent or somewhere. Um, and uh, the... Um, the nice thing about this is that you can, when you walk through it, you're actually at a lower height than their working floor level. So you actually walk through uh, eye level with a working port. So you can get some new and interesting different views of things. Right, now, there, there it is, there it is. 
So it's actually, Chris, it's actually yeah. remarkable that that place is so clean and it doesn't smell either, does it? No, no. Um, so another little, little gadget for you. Um, Talking about, so one of the problems with, oh, Charlie, sort yourself out. Um, got the comedy dog with me tonight. Um, so, one of the problems with taking pictures every week is it's really easy to get stuck in a rut. And so, ways of breaking yourself out of that is to use different equipment or different themes, um, like the angle finder I used and stuff like that. So, um, one of the things I, I played with, this is a, a lens baby, or this is a lens baby. And they refer to the lens baby, let's see if we can get closer here, is um, they refer to it as the love child of a tilt and shift lens and a slinky spring. Yeah. All right, so how do you use it? Well, what you do is you grab the lens like that. You then pull it in to focus it. Once you've got it in focus, you can then move the focus point about. And when you finally got it exactly how you want, you realize you've got to get your fingers on the shutter release uh, to take your picture. So what does this thing give you? Well, what it gives you is classically, it gives you an area of sharpness like this, and then around it, a sort of motion blurred area um, going outwards. And you can move the, the area of sharpness around the around your frame. Um, now, that's easy enough to do in Photoshop. You know, take a second layer, um, motion blur it, and erase through, job done. Um, but where's the fun in that, yeah? I mean, why not get it right in camera? Why not change your vision? And you might do something different that you otherwise wouldn't normally do. So the lens baby comes out from time to time, um, just different views something with a bit of a film noir feel, something like that. And um, I put this on my, on my um, blog once, that I, how much I was enjoying using the lens baby um, and put this picture in with it. And I'd no sooner posted it to my blog than about 20 minutes later, I got an email from the guy who invented the lens baby. And he sent me this email and he said, hi, Chris, love the picture well bent, as in well bent the end of the lens. And uh, turned out that he wondered if he could actually use this as an example picture. This is the clocks at Canary Wharf of what you could do with a lens baby. And so for about six months, this was on the lens baby website. Um, so we get patterns, extracts, abstract shots. Um, Always looking out for patterns. I mean, pretty traditional to do a shot of the uh, the Boris bikes or the Sadiq cycles, um, but not everybody spots this uh, sculpture outside a bank in Cannon Street. This is a, a fence um, in Docklands, and yeah, it's not a particularly interesting picture. But what I did with this was I spent um, a whole hour using it to learn how depth of field works. So I'd focus at different ends of the uh, scene. I'd use different length lenses, um, different focus points, different F numbers to really get in my mind the relationship between the three and how that affected um, depth of field uh, with my specific camera uh, and my way of doing it. Um, now, that's the advantage with a project like this, is you can actually practice stuff and learn it, and then just, it doesn't matter, with digital, you can throw away all those pictures, it doesn't matter, as long as you've learned what you wanted to learn out of it, or learn something different. Um, but, you know, that extra hour was really useful, because now I sort of instinctively understand what I want to do with depth of field, and I don't constantly need to think, oh, I need to change this, I need to change that. That's all sort of now in muscle memory, and I kind of understand it better. Uh, sometimes when you take a picture, you sit down and stay. Um, sometimes when you take a picture, um, you're never quite sure what the title is going to be. 
So you might get Sunrise over South End six, um, <laughs> Dawn five, um, and other times you know exactly what this, the title was going to be before you press the shutter. And this was one of those occasions. This one I decided it was going to be called Snake and Ladders. Uh, back to the blue building. This is a, a more abstract view of it. And I kind of like this because you can't decide what's inside and what's outside. It's just a pattern shot. OK, this is a view of a famous building in the city. Um, anybody want to tell me what building it was, is? You can unmute by pressing your space bar if you're muted. Anybody want to guess? Give me a couple of seconds. A dog that's been asleep all day and suddenly woken up and going mad. Right, um, this is the gherkin. This is the drains around the outside of the gherkin. And that's the thing with a project like this, is that if you... Um, visit somewhere first you're going to take the obvious shot second time you start might start to take something slightly less obvious after about 15 times you start looking for really unusual and different views of stuff um this is a more standard view of the um the gherkin with the window cleaners involved and here it is cuddling up to the cheese grater over the road um around the corner we get to the tower now, the Heron Tower is the tallest building in the city of London, i.e. the square mile, not the Shard, which is the tallest building in London. Um, and I think it's something like 32 floors high. Um, and the nice thing is you can actually get up the top of this. Um, you get up the top by, there's a bar called Sushi Samba, and you can get up there and um, as long as you buy a drink, then you're free to wander around the bar and take pictures. There's two floors and you can even go, there's an area outside, you can even go and take pictures if you like. Um, and that sounds okay. Um, and now I went there, I think this was nine years ago, might have been even more than that. And I went in there with two friends and I said, uh, don't worry lads, I'll get this round. Um, and I bought three small bottles of beer, 27 quid, uh, and that was nine years ago. Um, and yet still cheaper than going up the Shard, so um, probably still worth it. Um, this is at St Catherine's Dock. This is called Straight Through the Heart. And this is under, uh, under the Barbican. And uh, I took this picture and I put it on eFotozine for critique. And a few people looked at it and said, oh, it's fine, but what you want to do is you want to swap it left to right and look much better, read much better. So I did, I swapped it left to right, printed it out, put it in competition. The judge took one look at it and said, it's fine, but really you should swap it right to left, it will look much better. Um, and so <laughs> I've swapped it backwards and forwards so many times, I'm not really sure. Uh, which way round it actually is in real life, but you know, that's underneath the Barbican. Talking to titles you know before you press the shutter. This one is called A Tower of Tat in the Tower of London Tat Shop. And this is the sort of thing that I, I kind of like taking pictures of. Pictures that make people think, what is it they're looking at? Why is he taking that picture? Making people wonder a little bit. Talking to wondering. Um, there's three words you don't often see together. I assume the warm lamb submarine wasn't available. Who knows? Um, and you get to um, Lord Mayor's Parade in November. And they usually have a fun fair for it. And here it was set up the weekend, set up a few days before. I just like the kind of forlorn look of the, of the um, dodgems with the uh, leaves blowing around them and the reflection. Here's a pattern shot, came out in the office, saw these pile of magazines waiting to be collected. Um, and uh, just, the, I just sort of like grabbed the shot and I thought that works as a pattern shot, it's quite fun. Um, similarly, another shot of scaffolding, um, 
just to give you a, a you know different pan shot. Scaffolding is really hard to get a decent shot of. You ideally even need a tilt and shift lens, or you need to get up level with it to get the um, some sort of some close to being straight. If you stand at the bottom and shoot, when you try and straighten it in Photoshop, it's never going to look right at all. Um, this is a small detail from the Golden Hind over on the South Bank. And this is a detail from one of the Wren churches. I don't do much shooting in the Wren churches during the daytime because when I'm out lunchtime, um, usually you go in there and there's people in there either praying or trying to grab a quiet moment because they're having a bad time. Um, and it seems really crass to wander around taking shots. So generally speaking, I, I usually avoid them um, <laughs> at lunchtime um, because it just seems a bit weird to me. There's always plenty of um, sculpture things going on in the city. This is over near London Bridge. Now, with a, with a sculpture, um, it's tempting to just take the record shot. But once you've taken the record shot, then try and look for something creative, look for a different approach to um, what it is you shoot. Now, try and just grab an extract of the thing to sum up your view of this object and some new approach to it. Um, I was walking around Broadgate and... There was a whole series of um, different bits of sculpture by people like Tracy Emin and people like that. And one of them was this one. And I thought, I wonder who did this? Um, this little figure pulling this horse. When I looked at the, um, the display card, it turned out it was a local primary <coughs> school. I thought it was really cool. Um, again, if you come out of Broadgate... Um, and look up, there are five big metal sheets leaning against each other. And if you look straight up, this is the shot you get. Now, a lot of photographers with, I've shot with um, in, the, in London um, are better at making excuses than they are at take, making pictures. Um, because quite often you go out and they'll say, oh, the light's not right, it's too dark, it's too dim, it's too dull, it's too bright. And my thought is that, well, find something to make a picture of with that light. You know, pretty much every, everything has the kind of right light that will work for stuff. Even if it's eye searingly bright reflections, you can do something like this with um, high contrast images. You know, why not try it, try it rather than just make excuses? This is called um, uh, a Hockney in Hackney. Um, and... This is called key light, which is, um, so I think it's a real photographer's picture. It's all about shadows, texture, light. Um, but the thing that really amazes me, this, this is round on, a, on the outside of a building near the Bank of England. And I always wonder what the break glass is doing on the outside of the building, not the inside. A little bit strange. King's Cross, um, if you come into London, uh, King's Cross is well worth a visit and well worth your time now. You've got the new roof at King's Cross um, and you've got next door, you've got some Pancras. If you've never been there, they are literally next door to each other. There's one road between the two. Um, and then underneath, um, you've got this light tunnel, uh, which is really popular for, with photographers. You get people walking past the lights. And then if you follow the light tunnel through, you get to a new area, which has got um, lots of new architecture for people like YouTube, and um, Facebook, uh, and then behind that you've got a canal, then you've got um, hotels made out of gasometers, a little park. Um, honestly, an hour up there is not long enough. Considering how, how tacky and horrible King's Cross used to be, it's really, really nice now and well worth a visit. But that's kind of one of the things I like about this project is that you see stuff that other people ignore. So this is the front of the Bank of England. And loads of people must be um, wandering past here every day. And very few of them notice this flower, but even less notice Mr. Punch here in the reflection. Reflection? Shadow is the word I'm looking for. Um, this is called the odd couples, odd couple of people, odd couple of phone boxes, odd couple of cones. And this is a slightly unusual picture of the shard. Um, what have I done to it? Nothing much, really. It's just a reflection in a puddle. You know, sometimes instead of looking at the object, 
look for reflections and new ways of approaching it. Um, colourful set of stairs on the south bank and a roof at Patmaster Square. Like I say, this, um, this detail um, that you notice, so this is um, next to the Millennium Bridge. Thousands of people walk past here. Um, this is um, the uh, Salvation Army building. And very few people ever notice this little detail the architect put in. But, you know, because I visited so often, I managed to get to see these new approaches. So this idea, I was talking to my friend about this idea of constant practice, you know, constantly using your camera, um, drilling and training and using your camera, drilling and training and using your, your um, photographic skills. Um, and he said, yeah, that's all right. He said, but um, you, you do street, you do landscape. He said, I'll do wildlife. You can't do wildlife in your lunch hour. I said, all right, give me a week. Let's see what I come up with. So what did I get? Well, I've got this one, which is called Pigeon and Piano. Um, and then this one, which is called On the Way to the Tower. Um, just north of the city of London is Bunhill Fields, which is an old burial ground and is also a nature reserve. Um, and the nature reserve... Uh, well, the burial ground has people like Daniel Defoe in it, but the Nature Reserve has um, very friendly squirrels in it. And when I say the squirrels are very friendly, I mean they are very friendly indeed. Um, I also managed to find some geese. Um, as far as I can work out, the geese of London live entirely on crisps fed to them by small children. Um, but, you know... And that was the wildlife I managed to get in a week. Uh, nature photography. Um, my friend Steve thinks I've got a leaf fetish, but I kind of like the juxtaposition of the, the natural and the built up environment. So these are two um, leaves floating around in Limehouse Basin. And there's one on the steps of uh, on the front of Southwark Cathedral. And to prove we go out in all weathers, there's two floating in a fountain and there's the rain coming down there and there. Getting out to Canary Wharf, um, which is pretty easy from Bank Station um, on the DLR, you can nip up there fairly quick. Uh, this was, um, they used to have just after uh, Christmas, they used to have the World Ice Carving uh, Championships there. And this guy is here, carving up a big block of ice. Um, they don't have that anymore. I'll tell you what they do have in a minute. But um, it's also got now the um, Elizabeth's Line Station, uh, Crossrail Station, which is fast becoming one of the most photographed uh, places in London. It's got this fantastic walkway into it, which uh, if, you stand, if you stand in the middle, it looks like this. And... Um, I said they replaced the um, ice sculpting with a light festival every year. And the light festival turns this pretty, um, quite extraordinary building into something really rather special. Um, if you can get to the light festivals, they are well worth it. There's lots of interest there. And they even have this, which is, um, this is a permanent thing under now that's, um, it's water droplets that drop down and they spell out words randomly from the front of the Times newspaper um, as they drop down. But for me, I, I, one of the things I really enjoyed was just taking pictures of people interacting um, with the uh, exhibits and stuff like that. And this is a real challenge because, um, you know, throw away everything you've ever heard about high ISOs being bad, um, You've got to get a picture that works. Um, and so you soon learn a lot about your camera, try, taking stuff in this sort of darkness to try and get something you actually want. Another favourite location is Somerset House. Um, in the summer, it's got this big square. Uh, in the winter, that becomes an ice rink. And it's also got the uh, Nelson Staircase, which is a, quite an interesting piece of architecture on its own. Um, 
But my favourite location probably has got to be the South Bank Centre. You can get out there from Bank on the um, Waterloo line um, in one stop, so it doesn't take long to get there. And when you get there, there's always something new there. And like I say, with art, I'm always looking for take my take on it, something different from the original shop. Um, so, for instance, in this one, this is um, a picture of um, me standing in one bit of art, taking a picture of another piece of art. And this is called A Prisoner of Love. But you can even do sports photography in your lunch hour. Um, so under the South Bank, you famously, you've got the um, skateboard park. Um, and uh, again, you can learn so much from this because it's completely different to, you know, um, ordinary street photography or landscape photography or cityscape photography. You know, we're moving at different speeds and, you, and it's dark under there as well. So you've got to work out how you're going to freeze motion and get the, get the impression that you want of what's happening. Um, and the nice thing is you can go down there one day take a load of photos, look at them, work out what you did wrong, read up the books and stuff, and come back the following week and do it again. You, know? um, you can learn from your mistakes, which is always good. But you can also learn how your equipment works. So um, with motion blur, for instance, um, if you read a lot of the older books um, and, and stuff, people say, oh, you can only motion blur if you've got the camera on a tripod, stuff like that. Well... I'm uh, now using Olympus uh, EM1 um, as my main camera, and that's got five stops of um, uh, image stabilisation, which means you can actually, and I've done this, you can hand hold an image for two seconds um, and it comes out sharp. And then you realise that two seconds is probably too long because everybody disappears in two seconds. Um, but, you know, but you'll only learn that really, by getting out and taking pictures and just trying stuff and seeing what will work. Um, over on the uh, South Bank, you get kids playing, and in the summer, you get this um, fat set of fountains called Rooms, and the kids playing in there um, make for a great little scene. Um, again, small camera for this. You really don't want to be seen with a great big lens. Um, you're going to get a load of hassle if you do that. A few years back, um, Anthony Gormley came to London. Um, being Anthony Gormley, he stuck loads of naked metal men around London. This one's called Gormley Towers. This one is called Looking at Legs. Um, the trouble is, if you stick a load of naked metal men around central London, at some point, somebody is going to check out his tackle. It's just the way it is. Um, but... <laughs> Even then on the South Bank, you've got a food market um, and just the strangest things like trees made out of fabric. There's always something new there. Um, this is a, a shop from the South Bank. And one of the things that I discovered with um, shooting in the city is that there's an element of repeatability. Um, because um, I saw this image um, I was walking along and I saw somebody walk down and I thought, that's exactly where I want somebody to be. But obviously I hadn't got my camera out in time, so I didn't get the shot. But I only had to wait a minute and then somebody else walks down the stairs and bang, you can get the person exactly where you wanted them in the composition. Um, go out in all weathers. Um, this one's called Polishing Clouds. And you very rarely see the um, Millennium Bridge looking quite this empty unless it's so cold the snow is smacking into the side of your face and uh, leaving it completely numb but you can get out when it rains if you've got waterproof camera that's fine if you haven't find an awning to stand under and you can get some shots of summer in the city um so this next shot is probably the most british shot i will ever take um you want to know why it's british why it's really really british well, first of all, we've got the Union Jack. Then we've got a black taxi. We've got a red bus. We've got a London Underground sticker. We've got hoppies. And finally, down in this corner, we've got two guys, Morris, dancing. How much more British do you want it? Um, 
This is called Long Walk Home. Um, if you see the tyres off his rim, and he's actually got a map there in his hand, so it looks like he really has got a long walk home. But there's, um, I suppose, like anywhere, London has its fair share of tragedy. Um, this is the Siemens Memorial uh, up on Tower Hill. And I like to think that this old chap was there uh, looking for lost fallen comrades. Um, but around about November time, the poppies start, or end of October time, the poppies start appearing. And each one's got the detail of somebody's son, father, brother, lover. Um, and then they, they form into, in, in the churchyards, into an absolute sea of poppies, and it becomes quite an emotional thing. Um, more modern tragedies. Uh, this is a guy who was hit by a truck from his motorbike. Now, I have a set of ethics about the photography I do. Um, so in something like this, um, I'm really not interested in taking a picture of the guy on the floor, yeah, because to my way of thinking, you know, it's not going to add anything and it's gonna, only going to add distress to him. Um, I'm not a news photographer, so it doesn't matter if I don't capture something uh, completely, but I don't mind taking pictures of these guys because they're doing their job, um, and they'd probably be quite happy to see a picture of themselves doing a, doing their job. But um, yeah, I, I really don't want to take pictures of somebody having a tragedy. This is the the road I work on, um, and it looks quite quiet there. But um, what actually happens? Uh, it's changed, all changed now. But for quite a time, you would get three lanes of traffic down each side, so you get. Uh, bikes, cars and lorries, then motorbikes down the middle. And again, motorbikes, cars and lorries and bikes. And so getting across it was really quite difficult. Um, and quite often you would come out of work and somebody hadn't made it all the way via the cross, and um, so, which was always pretty nasty. And here you find a, a set of flowers that were left in remembrance of somebody who didn't make it all the way across. Um, so down the underground. So my agent, oh, I'll say that again, because I like the sound of it, to be honest. My agent, um, I've got an agent, um, he's a company called uh, Art Vogue. And what they do is they specialise in uh, commercial photography for um, things like um, residential complexes, uh, private hospitals, hotels and stuff like that. And they um, basically will stick these up and I get money for it, which is nice. Um, but it sounds pretty cool having your own agent. But Danny was my agent there. He phoned me out one day and he said, he said, Chris, he said, what we need is more of your black and white London abstracts. I said, sure, we can do that. That shouldn't be a problem. He said, yeah, that's, he said, that's exactly the sort of thing we need, exactly the sort of thing that will sell. I said, yeah, great. He said, yeah, it's exactly the sort of nondescript thing we need. I don't know, you could really do without your agent telling you your stuff is nondescript. But um, I'll give you an idea of the sort of thing they're after. This is my best-selling set with them. Um, and it's the sort of thing that's arty enough to be interesting, but not so arty it upsets people. Uh, and that's the sort of market they're in. Um, but down the tube, you can try new approaches. So maybe um, set the camera for a long exposure and just stick it on the handrail of a travelator or an escalator and see what you get. If you don't get something you like, delete it. doesn't matter. Um, you've not lost anything. But um, what was the newest underground line and still is just at the moment until they open uh, Crossrail um, is um, the Jubilee line. And uh, it's got two interesting stations on this. This um, photographically, the, or the most interesting ones, are Canary Wharf, which has got this classic uh, open space. Um, quite, you know, most photographed place probably. But the other one, which is really strange, is Southwark Station, because there's no good reason to go to Southwark Station unless you need to get to Southwark. Yeah, you know, it's not on the way to anywhere. There's nothing particularly there, but they seem to have spent a lot of money on it because it's, it's got all these interesting views on it. And especially um, uh, down this area, which is sort of done out a bit like, um, 
like a 1950s Barbarella style sci fi movie, um, especially this view here. And so this was taken, this was a seven shot HDR image, handheld, taken underground, right? Now, if you believe the books, that's not possible, right? But if you spend your time uh, actually practicing and learning your gear and finding out what you can and can't get away with, then you discover that things they tell you aren't possible actually can be possible and can work for you. Um, and so that's the advantage of this regular practicing. You learn your gear and you learn yourself and you learn what interests you. And I make that about time for tea. I've got the lights out, so the fun's at me. Okay, folks, um, before I leap into the second half, they're still going, All right? Uh, before I leap into the second half, um, virtually all the locations I've um, talked about tonight are available in two books. One is this is the, minute, the photographer's guide uh, to London. And this one, the other one, the photo view, which is much thicker, which is photographing London. Well worth um, uh, getting if you're thinking of, if you're not local and you don't get a chance. Uh, I discovered most of these locations the hard way and then bought the books and then discovered them afterwards. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, it's well worth um, these books. Are, are just absolutely fantastic. Even if it's not just for London, if you're going for holiday to Northumberland or the Lake District or somewhere like that, they're great for just being able to, say you've got an hour to take a photo getting you somewhere where you can actually get a decent picture from. Um, so, moving on um, to the second half, just want to remind you about this idea of uh, practice. Um, you know, just leaving your camera on the side is not going to improve you as a photographer, but just taking photos, doesn't even matter if they're not any good. Yeah, it will actually help you improve uh, your photography. Um, I'm not above the odd cliche. Um, here we get with, uh, this is Tower Bridge. Managed to get down onto the uh, river taxi jetty um, and get a picture from down there at night, which is quite fun. And um, <clears throat> this is a long exposure from the Millennium Bridge. And you know what I was saying about the, uh, barges that they take down and dump in Kent. Um, I was taking this shot and underneath moved, uh, it's a tug with one, two, three barges behind it. And as it snaked underneath me, it made this shape, which looks a bit like a giant bird. So this one is called River Phoenix. Uh, so this is probably the most manipulated picture you will see tonight by far. Um, why is it the most manipulated picture? Well, it is three seven-shot HDR images. Uh, why is that? Well, because it was taken from the top of the shard. And if you think about the shape of the shard for a minute, it's basically a giant triangle. And when you're up there, up the top, all the lights behind you reflect in the glass. And normally you get your camera up against the glass flat to... Uh, get rid of the reflections. But because the glass is at an angle, you can't get it flat and you can't get rid of the reflections. So what I ended up doing in the end was taking three shots about two foot apart um, and then HDR in them and then combining and merging, bet uh, cloning between them um, just to get rid of all those reflections. And it got so bad that when it got to the sky, I had lost the will to live. So when I got to the sky, I just motion blurred it a bit to get the, the picture I wanted. Um, normally, I would not do that amount of work on a picture, but um, I paid to go up the shard. Um, so I wanted to come away with at least one picture I wanted. And the shard itself, um, so I took a, a normal sort of, uh, normal telephoto lens, um, up there, and it was probably a mistake because there are really only two views. There's this one, and there's one towards St Paul's because everything else you're looking at is South London, and who cares? And so um, 
there's not that ma many different sort of wide angle scenes. What I should have done, which is what I really would have liked to have done, was take a, say, a 300 mil lens. Um, you have to be a small one because um, you uh, they don't they're not keen on great big camera gear, but and look down on the street. Yeah, because there were some really interesting scenes looking straight down, um, almost like drone shots. And I wish I'd done that rather than just take a, a wide angle shot. But this one came out all right. So as I was saying earlier, um, I've moved from Canon gear to Olympus gear. And one of the advantages of moving to Olympus is that in a small bag about this, so bag, sort of satchel bag, um, I can take a camera, a, a pro camera, two lenses, um, all my Lee filters, Lee filter holder, and some Lee ND filters. And with a little tripod on the top, I've basically got the kit to do proper landscape photography in my lunch hour. And so that's what this is. This is a long exposure of the Millennium Bridge um, with the shard underneath, just, just practicing long exposures and, and the way they build up on the back of the screen. And similarly, uh, this one, another practice shot um, of the shard and the stairs from, oh, I can't remember the actual landing that's on, but um, this actually got me uh, commended in last year's Landscape Photographer of the Year, which is not bad for a practice shot, is it? Um, and here's a new view of um, Lloyd's, playing about with some more dramatic processing, uh, similarly with the uh, front of the um, London Stock Exchange building. This idea of practice and improving stuff. Um, we used to say, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. It's not really true. Because what will happen is things just get slightly worse and, and things go downhill if you always do the same. So you should kind of always strive to improve what you do. And it doesn't really matter whether it's, you know, in picking your locations, picking your time of day, um, gear, uh, post-processing, any of that. Um, as long as you try and improve, then your work will get better or at least stay the same. Um, but if you just always do what you always did, it will start getting worse. Um, so one of the things I started to practice at uh, was panoramas, because if I practice panoramas in the middle of London, um, when I need them, say, on a beach or um, uh, on a big scene in the Lake District or something like that, then I'll know how to do them. So this is the same shot everybody takes from the British Museum. And you wonder why everybody takes exactly the same composition. Till you get there, you go up the stairs, and basically there's a hole in the wall about, uh, yeah, about, about the same size as this window, as this <laughs> box. Um, and that's it. That's the only place you got to take this picture from. Um, there doesn't seem to be any other viewpoints around the rest of the thing. So you get stuck um, taking this one viewpoint, same as everybody else. But this is um, this is a panorama. This is 16 shots uh, merged together, um, all handheld. Worked fine. This, on the other hand, is a 64-shot uh, raw image. And when I took this... Um, and tried to merge it at the time my laptop at the time used to go away start processing it grunt and gurgle for about 10 minutes and then suddenly it would give a blue screen of death saying the processor had overheated um, and i wasn't actually able to finish processing this um, till till i got a new laptop and could actually do it um, i'm currently working on a contract um, which features a 3.2 gigapixel image um, made of 180 separate images. Um, luckily, I could do that because I've been practicing with this sort of thing beforehand and I've learned how to, how to do that and what not to do. Um, so people, um, in this theme of pushing yourself into areas you don't normally go to, I don't consider myself a people photographer. I don't even think I'm a people person, to be honest. I'm pretty much of the, of the opinion that if you've met one person, you've pretty much met them all. And so um, people photography is naturally quite difficult for me, but that's the point. 
push yourself into areas you wouldn't normally have a go at. And so here we get, um, this is Oval Station, looking like Fritz Lang's Metropolis. And here's two things linked by colour. Um, again, this idea of repeatability in the city. Um, this looks like it'd be quite hard to arrange for somebody wearing a red coat to walk past something red. Um, I've walked past this building hundreds of times, and pretty much every time I do, I look out to see if there's somebody in a red coat. And the second or third person past will be wearing a red coat. Because there's so many people in the city, you get some degree of repeatability. Similarly, um, I walked past this scene a load of times. And every time I thought there's a picture there, but there'd be like a load of kids playing here or a load of hairy ass builders sitting here. And it wasn't quite what I wanted. And finally, one day I walked past and there was just this single girl um, lost in thought. And I got the shot I wanted. And this one is called Shard snake and sandwich. <laughs> so I was standing take, I was standing taking photos and a gorilla came out of the bank. Can't tell you any more than that. That's, that's all I know. There's a man dressed as a gorilla came out of the bank. Um, this one I decided is called communication. I like the idea that these two are just texting each other. Um, and this guy, I was down by the down by the Thames, and it was a sunny day. And this guy came down. He looked filthy. He looked like he'd been working incredibly hard. He kicked off his shoes and immediately fell asleep. And so uh, I processed it to make it look as as grubby as he must have actually felt. Um, and it's not that unusual in the summer to see people falling asleep all over the place, and you can get some shots. Uh, this is the, the Banksman, a uh, um, building site. I thought he just looked really, really cool, so I grabbed a snap of him. And uh, not really sure what this guy's looking at, but he does seem quite keen on it. Um, so a bit of a rule for you. Um, if you stick a 10-foot-high gorilla in the middle of London, with a fish under its arm and leave it for uh, a little while, pretty soon somebody will come along and start to feed it. Um, it was the most bizarre thing. <laughs> this is a sculpture of a, a gorilla with a fish under its arm. I was standing there and I thought somebody would try and feed that in a minute. I stood there with the camera and within a few seconds, yeah, this girl was pretending to feed this gorilla. This is part of the sculptures you get around the, the gherkin each, uh, in that area. Um, there's another one. So this looks like I've drawn it on the screen, doesn't it? But it's not. It's actually a, a sculpture done as a, a, a line art. Uh, these two guys, I have absolutely no idea who they are, but I feel somewhere they're doing a Zoom presentation saying, I don't know who the fat bloke is in the other side, but... Um, This is called Up the Greasy Pole. And this one's called Kicking Pigeons. This is called Watching You, Watching Me. Uh, and now you could argue that this is mainly somebody else's picture. That's fair enough. But for me, what makes it is the look on these two guys' faces as I'm standing the other side of the road and they're both thinking, what on earth is he taking a photo of? Ah, so this is down near Clink Street, and I, I saw these two eyes on the door, and I thought, what I'll do is I'll create a sort of vignette around it, so as it looks like the eyes are looking at this guy, and I called it Watching You Work. And I put it into competition, and the judge took one look at it and said, Watching You Work? Well, he's got his back to us. We can't see him working at all. <sighs> Honestly, I don't know why I bother. I really don't. Um, this is a guy um, surprised by some sculpture in Broadgate. Now, one of the things that uh, people often say to me, oh, you're ever so brave taking pictures. I'll be ever so scared taking pictures in the city. Or, oh, you know, I worry about upset people. How do you take pictures of people? Well, my top tip is this. If you walk into a space and grab your camera and start taking photos like this, 
you're going to really annoy people, yeah, and really upset them. It's quite invasive to walk into somebody's space and start taking photos of them. So I never do that. I will walk into a space and then just wait only a few minutes till everybody's walked through the space and out the other side. Then when you pick your camera up, suddenly they are walking into your space. And it goes from being confrontational to people walking around behind you because they don't want to get in your shots or saying sorry for getting in your shots. And it's simply because you now own the space. By waiting that few minutes, um, you, you get gain control and you can save yourself a lot, a lot of hassle, a lot of arguments just by uh, a few, few seconds wait. This is called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Kind of shows how much the uh, camera can lie, though, because he looks really miserable here. But I took this shot, and then he turned and looked at me and gave me the loveliest smile. Just lost in thought. This one's called The Full Monty. And this is outside uh, the British Museum. I love the effect on it. I love the way that looks. I don't know. Honestly, I flattened the Photoshop file after I did this. And I have no idea how I ever achieved that look. I'd love to be able to do it again. Um, but I don't know what it is I did. A uh, bit of a shame, though. This is called um, Together Alone. And, uh, right, so legally, legally, if you do a talk about um, street photography, you have to mention Henry Carter Bresson and the decisive moment. It's just the law, just the way it is. Um, so... Um, let's get this bit over and done with. So the decisive moment, I never really got this, yeah, because landscape photography, I mean, we've all seen people sort of recreate almost exactly the same shot Joe Cornish has achieved. Um, and wildlife photography, and let, I mean, you've, you've seen one bird on a stick, you've pretty much seen them all. Um, but, you know, occasionally, to, to be really interesting, the animal has to be doing something so unusual these days. Because um, there's an element of repeatability, especially with fast cameras, you can get lots of shots. Um, and, you know, skilled photographers as well. But um, <laughs> with street photography, I suddenly realised you've got this element of time. Because these two people don't know each other. They will never sit next to each other again. Um, that moment, that decisive moment, will never happen again. And so... I realise that you've got this extra dimension of actual history or time that you're capturing as well. And as a little uh, homage, there's uh, somebody skipping across Bank Junction. Uh, at some point, I will Photoshop in a puddle underneath him just to uh, make it the full Aaron Carter press on treatment. This is uh, an alleyway around the back of the London Stock Exchange building. I wanted to make it look as scary as possible. Well, that's the worst case of piles ever, isn't it? Um, so around by um, uh, City Hall, they quite often have outdoor photography exhibitions. And I like to capture uh, people interacting with the photog photographic exhibition. So what you get there is you get, um, this is a guy in, 20, in London in 2012, looking at a woman in Sarajevo in 1990 who's looking around the street corner for snipers. But usually you just work out your shot and you stand and you wait for your actors to walk into it. I mean, even something that seemed quite tricky, like a, a Parmesan umbrella, actually really relatively easy to see once you've worked out the angles, when you've worked out where you're going to stand, you just wait for the next person to walk along and give you the shot you want. It's called Passing Strangers. Um, and so how do you get a shot like this? <coughs> how do you know this guy is going to be looking at the, um, the person you want? Well, you can, you can try and be lucky. Or what you can do is stand on the other side of the road and deliberately stand there quite obviously with your camera up to your eye. Because what happens is people walk along the road and then they see a guy over there with a camera and their immediate reaction is to turn and look and see what he's taking a picture of. And click, you've got your shot. Yeah. Um, this one, I went back through the actual, I was going to say negatives, but the, the actual shots before this. There was um, six shots before I got somebody 
to do exactly what I wanted them to do. Really, relatively easy to achieve if you've just got the front to stand there and look obvious. Uh, or you can just happily find somebody um, standing there in the right position. This, by the way, was shortlisted, shortlisted for Landscape Photographer of the Year. Not a landscape, not even remotely a landscape. Who knew? Um, this young lady is clearly a big fan of the bagpipes. And this one is called Pigeon's Dilemma. It's called Did You Get the Picture? And um, so every year they have a City of London festival and it's got um, dancing and cinema and all sorts of things. And um, one year I was there and they had some Balinese dancers. And I went down there and I took some pictures and I took loads of really boring record shots, nothing very interesting at all. And then a thing that a friend of mine says played French in my mind. And he, he says, um, go beyond the obvious. Look around the action rather than at the action. And I started to look around maybe for crowd reaction shots. But then I looked down and I saw that the um, shadows the dancers were casting were actually more interesting than the... Um, than the pictures themselves. So sometimes, instead of always thinking we should be looking at this object, look around it and look for something different. This is called a shapely ankle. This is called a sign of the times. So this is man on a mission. And um, so one of the things that took me a long time to work out was how you know what's going to happen. Um, because the news is okay at telling you what has happened. But if you want to be there when it does happen, that's quite hard. And it took me a while to work out. And then finally, I realised that the best way to do this was Twitter. Uh, so I'm, instead of, you know, following the latest arguments, my Twitter features things like City of London Police, uh, the City of London Tourist Board, Tower Bridge, Tower Bridge, um, or more London, Canary Wharf. All these things that where if they've got something on that they want you to go to, they will post it on their Twitter feed and you can get out. And so one day I was sitting there looking through it and I saw that there was road closures um, on the City of London uh, police site. And I followed it and I followed a bit more information. And it turned out it was a protest called the Carnival Against Capitalism. And I just watched it on Twitter um, where they were. And about half past one, they were pretty much outside the building I work in. So all I had to do was wander downstairs and then I'm in a demonstration and I'm taking repertage shots of a demonstration, which is, you know, really quite fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, quite enjoyed that. This one is called Are You Looking at My Bird? Um, so, again, this is... So street photography, um, he doesn't like the idea that I'm taking his picture. It's quite clear that he doesn't like that. How did I get away with not being thumped? There's a couple of things, right? Um, one is that you never make eye contact with your subject. Um, so, for instance, if I was shooting him, or when I was shooting him, I would look up uh, at the building and then look down at the flipped out back of my camera and take the shot. And because I'm not making eye contact with him, um, he doesn't think I'm taking a photo of him. I'm, I mean, I'm not very far from him. I'm like that three, three paving steps. And that's as close as I actually am. Um, and, you know, if you defocus your eyes slightly, it's the same technique you use to avoid charity muggers. Um, you just sort of like slip your eyes out of gear um, and then they never maintain eye contact with you. So after a few seconds, they realise that, Nobody would take a picture of them without actually looking at them. And so you can get on and carry on taking photos. Uh, homelessness. Um, a bit, I was talking about uh, photographic ethics. Ethics, just uh, south of Sussex. Um, and um, so with homeless photography, I don't mind taking a picture of the problem 
but I don't like taking pictures of the people who are actually homeless because I find a lot of that stuff is more exploitative than informative. Um, and so, you know, here's, here's a guy on the streets and this was taken, it was minus four during the day and this is some poor sod's bed. Um, so imagine trying to sleep there that night. It must have been absolutely free. You, know, just, you just have to hope that they found somewhere a bit more shelter. Having said I don't normally take their photos, I'm a bit of a dog person, as you know, by the fact that I run up and down stairs with a dog a couple of times. Um, and I just love the relationship between these two, um, how close they were. Um, and so I just uh, took a few snaps of them together. So one of the things you get in London, obviously, are the big events. Um, last really big event was Margaret Thatcher's funeral. This is the cables waiting for it. Um, I thought it was going to be good. I thought there'd be lots of stuff to take pictures of. But it turned out that when I got there, um, that they'd actually locked down most of the city of London. It was almost impossible to get uh, anywhere near the action. In fact, the only shot I got was this one of a policeman telling me I shouldn't be taking photos, which was uh, fun. Um, alternatively, Extinction Rebellion protests. Um, I love Extinction Rebellion protests. Um, they don't mind you taking their photos. If you, are, if you want to do sort of street photography or you want to have a crack at it, get on one of these demos. Ain't nobody minds you taking photos. Um, you can even ask them to pose if you want to or just stand in front of them and take pictures. And as long as when, when you take the photos, you smile at people and, um, you know, you act like you're on their side, people don't mind. Um, they really don't object to you taking their photos and you can just wander around. And the, the crowd at um, Extinction Rebellion uh, process is quite strange because it's basically either students or OAPs, as far as I can work out. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of admire the, the sort of bravery of um, an OAP who super glues himself to a road or something like that. I think that's quite uh, tremendous. Oh, having said that most people don't mind having their photograph taken, this young lady here in the bottom right really didn't like having her photo taken. And she stormed off after I took that picture. Um, she could have asked me why I'd taken the picture. <laughs> I don't know why I'm upset, but there you go. But yeah, you get quite a diverse crowd on Extinction Rebellion protests. And there's so much subject matter that um, it's absolutely exhausting for photographers. Um, and the nice thing, this was the occupation of Bank Junction. And no sooner had a, a, um, an ambulance siren come into view, then immediately the junction was cleared and the ambulance crew came through to cheers and waves. Um, a friend of mine's a major incident controller for the London Ambulance, and they've got this picture on his wall. Um, but for me, the thing that really makes the um, Extinction Rebellion protest uh, is the Red Brigade. Um, I think it's so dramatic, so theatrical. They move through the space as one, constantly staying in character, constantly being part of the scene, um, they capture the attention uh, and they really do capture your eye as you see them. Um, and so you think that, well, these are just um, protest shots. They don't have to just be protest shots, especially in the modern world where you're using projected images. You can crop big lumps out of your pictures and still get away with it. I took this image, I cropped it and processed it to give me that. Um, that's won me quite some quite a few competitions and points. Um, it's quite a dramatic scene. And when you listen to the judges, they all say, oh, it must have been done in a studio and it must have been done in this. And um, well, it could have been done in a studio, but it isn't. It's just cropped out of a, um, a protest shot. And this is the, the, the Red Brigade. Um, suddenly come across the front of the crowd, just everybody parts for them, they move through, and they're there offering support to people who had occupied the YouTube building. And I just find it really, um, it's sort of quite moving when they, when they move. So, yeah, we get to the, um, back in uh, 2008, um, we get the, uh, Gordon Brown was prime minister and he invited the 
G20 over to solve the problems of the financial crash. And um, the protest, the, the politicians came with protesters. The protesters were anti globalization protesters. Um, and they all gathered in Bank Junction as a massive great protest. Um, this was great, yeah, because, you know, it's not often you get a chance to uh, enjoy a riot in your lunch hour. Um, it's something that they should do more of. I think it would improve um, uh, staff morale a lot, really. But so I was there. Um, and to this day, I can't tell you what the protest was actually about, what it was for. Um, uh, the signs didn't help. Um, in fact, a friend of mine who was also there said it was National Get It All Off Your Chest Day because it just seemed to be a load of weird protests. Um, but the police had decided the best way to um, deal with this was to, what they call kettle the uh, protesters. And they decided to pen them in to the bank junction. You do a kettle by basically forming one line of police against the protesters and a second line um, behind them to stop protesters joining. And they, they form the, the strong line by holding on to each other's belts like this. Um, about this point, uh, a very terribly nice police sergeant came over to me and said, uh, excuse me, sir, um, you can either go inside the kettle or outside the kettle, but I can't allow you to stay between the lines of protest, uh, lines of policemen. Um, I would have liked to have gone inside the kettle, but um, this is my lunch hour. I've got to go back to work in a minute. So um, instead, I decided to take a tour around the outside as the, as the kettle was being formed uh, slowly. Um, clearly, there were some people there who were there for trouble. Um, there wasn't much trouble, to be honest. Um, and there were some people there who clearly didn't have a clue what was going on. Talking of which, I like this um, this chap protesting on his own. Um, I quite, quite like that. I got on my that. But there were some arrests, and there was even uh, a celebrity. Um, if you've ever walked backwards down the right down a road trying to focus a 300 mil lens, you develop a grudging respect for paparazzi. Um, well, that's my excuse for why it's not sharp anyway. But around the corner, we get to. Um, this guy from Associated Press was doing a piece to camera. I stood and listened to him, and pretty much everything he said was factually wrong. Really quite strange to listen to. But one of the things you do get at protests um, now is just the sheer number of cameras. Everybody had a camera. At one point, there was, a pro there was a, some pushing and shoving, and the whole front rank of um, protesters put their phones up to record it. And even the police are recording bang. Um, every, what's going on. Everything's filmed. Um, and like I say, around the corner, this, this, these three blockaded the local Tesco's. No idea why. I've read their signs hundreds of times. I still don't know what the protest was actually in favour of at all. Uh, that evening, I came out of work. Uh, most of the protest has been cleared. Um, there was some damage. But... Um, it passed off relatively peacefully. Around the corner was the climate camp. And the idea of the climate camp, they were going to um, camp on Broadgate uh, about climate change. And at least you could understand what this was about. You knew it was about climate change. Um, so the following morning, I come into the city, and it was a bit weird, because normally this had all been cleared away. But it, it hadn't been, because the police had been clearing the, the uh, climate camp overnight. Um, there were still loads of protests, uh, loads of graffiti everywhere. Um, like I say, difficult to know. Oh, oh, okay. All right, sorry, <laughs> pressed the wrong button. Um, yeah, difficult to know what the actual protest was in favour of, but one thing we can be sure of is that some of them were West Ham fans. Uh, the following day, following uh, lunchtime, uh, the people came back for round two. Uh, more, less people, but um, there were still arrests. And then um, the information came out that a protester had died um, the night before. It turned out it wasn't a protester. It was Ian Thomas and the uh, newspaper man. And, um, but we didn't know that at the time, and everybody was creating banners. And I, I stood there watching 
uh, as more and more um, tributes went up on the, on the board from the news. And eventually people stood and, and laid flowers at the feet of the police. And now for something a little bit more cheerful. Probably the best time ever to be a Londoner, London 2012, um, the Olympics. First thing we knew about the Olympics was the city was decorated. Even down at Waltham Abbey, they put flowers down the middle of the dual carriageway. And then appeared the um, Olympic mascots, Wenlock and Mandeville. Each of them decorated to match where they were. So this is um, Tower Bridge, Broadgate, or Bishopsgate. Um, this is the city, Canary, um, Purdy King. No idea what this one's about, um, but that one's uh, next to the Golden Hind as well. And here we have one with a red telephone box. But um, so that was pretty much it on the lead up. And the first thing we really saw was the procession of the uh, Olympic flame. So I got into bank junk. I got into work at eight o'clock and I think it was going through bank junction about half past nine, quarter of ten. So I got into work. I hung my coat over the back of my chair. So as it looks like I'm in the office and then I walked straight out again. Um, I went, went and stood in the middle of Bank Junction on a little raised area, and I thought that would be perfect. That would give me a chance to get the shot I want. I stood there, and more and more people came into the square as they're waiting for the, the flame to go through. Uh, and with about 10 minutes, 15 minutes to go, suddenly there was a surge. The crowd moved forward. And I had a choice. Did I go with the crowd or did I stay on my raised area? And I decided to stay on the raised area. Big mistake. Because suddenly I'd gone from being up the front and raised up to being 12, 14 rows back. So much so that when the um, Olympic flame came through, all I could see was a sea of camera phones. So this is the shot I got. This is somebody's camera phone, taking a picture of somebody else's camera phone, taking a picture of somebody else's camera phone, taking a picture of somebody else's camera phone which may or may not have a picture of the Olympic flame. Right? But so the following day, um, it came back. It was coming down the Thames. This time I was taking no chances. At work, I've got my screen that I'm working on. Over here, I've got the map of where the flame is. And over here, I've got the TV feed. And I'm working away and I look and it's a Richmond. Working away, it's a Richmond. Look over to the TV feed. It's just going under London Bridge. Grab me gear, hurtle down to Tower Hill. Um, and I get down to Tower Hill just in time to see the flame go out. <laughs> Unfortunately, there was <laughs> two guys who did the same thing as me. They, they got there almost exactly the same time. And one of his mates, one of them went, oh. And his mate, quick as a flash, turned around and said, Never mind, I've seen fire before. Um, now we're into the Olympics and we get the gifts from the Olympic gods. This is a shot put smashing into Waterloo Road uh, and big paintings on the side of buildings. And then the Olympic houses. Um, I've never heard of these before, but these are somewhere that they can um, wine and dine people or uh, promote their country. So this is the Swiss house, which featured mountaineering and chocolate. No bad combination. And then we get back to the Danish house, which featured Lego and Vikings. And these guys doing the Viking stuff really worked hard. Um, and though, to be honest, I'm not sure that having a tattoo done with a pointed stick in the traditional way is going above and beyond the call of duty, to be honest. It's a member of the Kazakhstan team, a bit confused by the concept of Stratford. And there's one of the French team out training. Uh, around the corner to us, uh, Old Louts Hockey Club, was one of the training venues for the, the hockey, and hockey used to be my game. Um, so it was great to get down there. You could get quite close because there wasn't really any security. So this is the Chinese team practising, um, which was quite fun to watch. And then the first event I actually managed to get to was the um, badminton. And uh, I just took in my little Olympus camera, um, and 
managed to capture all the shots. Now, I'm not a great badminton fan, but just watching the best in the world do their thing is really quite entertaining. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are, at the end of the day, somebody has to lose. Uh, the other event I got to was the women's mountain biking. This was down at Hadley in near um, South End. I don't know why I'm telling you that. You know, you know where it is, do you? Um, <laughs> I forget, forget which club I'm pulling. Um, and uh, it, I thought this was an absolutely excellent location because you could wander around and get shots of um, them doing their thing, get really up close with the best in the world, throwing themselves down those steep hills. Uh, absolutely ridiculous, brilliant venue, uh, really well done. Um, but the thing that really made the Olympics um, was the crowds, yeah, because the atmosphere in London during that uh, during that time from the Olympics through the Paralympics was absolutely amazing. Everybody seemed cheerful. I don't know if it's all the people who told us it was going to be rubbish had gone on a holiday somewhere else or just that the atmosphere was great. I mean, I even saw Londoners helping tourists. That's how... Um, uh, wonderful the atmosphere was people just seemed to be there to enjoy themselves and it was a really really great time had by all and i think that probably the thing that really made it for anybody who went to any of the venues was the games makers um, they were amazing they just really lifted the atmosphere and made it really worth going but having gone for the olympics um i wasn't really that bothered about the olympics the thing i was really waiting for was the paralympics and i got tickets to the opening ceremony because to me, um, being able to run fast is quite impressive. Being able to run fast with no legs is much, much more impressive in my book. And what makes somebody who's got no arms and no legs decide to go swimming, I have no idea. So I've always found the Paralympics an absolutely fascinating thing to uh, watch and get absorbed with. What time is it? With the Olympics or the Paralympics, you stand and watch it, you start watching a sport. Um, you've never seen before, and by the end of it, you're an absolute uh, addict of it, a guru to this, the opening ceremony. Um, so the, the parade of athletes was the middle of the uh, opening ceremony. It started with Greece, as is traditional, and then went on for quite some time, it has to be said. But then eventually Team GB came in, and they came into a sea of camera phones and to Heroes by David Bowie. And... Uh, see a confetti as well and I'm not a particularly patriotic person but it just made the hair stand up on the back of your neck it was an incredible moment really sort of um, emotional to be honest and um, but for me the thing that really made the opening ceremony was being right inside a huge fireworks display with these massive great fireworks going off over your head um, launched everywhere um and i've never been in a display like it and, uh, and the whole thing ended with everybody singing i am what i am which i thought was a perfect way to end it and then in the um baseball stadium the final event of the paralympics was the wheelchair basketball which was in australia versus canada um and if you've ever seen wheelchair rugby oh it's yeah, not wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby. Um, it's basically like robot wars, but for people. They slam into each other. They don't take any prisoners. They used to call it murder ball, I believe, but they changed it to wheelchair rugby to make it a bit more respectable. But these guys just, just really just ram into each other. It's really quite aggressive sport. It's, it's great fun to watch. Um, and it was really good fun just there. Um, Again, getting shots of it and just enjoying it. And eventually, uh, Australia won. And the final thing of the Olympics was the Parade of Heroes. And I got out um, from work, wandered down, and I joined these people who were in part of the opening ceremony. And then the builders started putting up some bunting. And then came the procession of heroes. And the thing I liked about this was that it wasn't split into Olympians and Paralympians. It was split into the cycling team and the running team. 
And it didn't matter whether they had an Olympic medal or a Paralympic medal. To us, they were all heroes. Uh, and I think that's kind of how it should be, to be honest. Um, and, you know, people say, was the Olympics kind of worth the money? Well, to me, to see four and a half million people on the streets of London cheering a young lad in a wheelchair, I think it was worth every penny. And um, so that's kind of it for tonight. The final thoughts I want to leave you with is get out there and practice because every shot you take is going to make you a better photographer. You're going to learn something from it. And, you know, violinists, painters, we all need to practice our craft so as we can get better at it. And it's going to cost you nothing with digital. I mean, all the pictures you've seen tonight are my practice images. I never went out with the intention of getting a competition winner or something. I was just practicing my craft. And luckily, I came away with something that worked. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. Really enjoyable. Mm.